Hello, and welcome to Shakespeare in Context with Claire. There has been a debate raging about whether Shakespeare used a letter about a storm off the coast of Bermuda as a source for this play. I have made a very exciting discovery which might blow the whole Bermuda debate right out of the water. So let's start with some dates. The earliest record of the play called The Tempest was in November 1611. As it is presumed that there is no earlier performance of the play, it is thought that the play had been new at this time, therefore dating the play to 1610-1611. There was a play called A Tragedy of the Spanish Maze, as yet unattributed, which Richard Malin suggests might be The Tempest. Let's see where the sources and current events give us a clue to the dating of the play. There is no main source for The Tempest. It is thought that Shakespeare was influenced by Strachey's letter, dated 1610, describing a storm in which the ship, Sea Venture, gets into trouble and is driven onto the rocks off the coast of Bermuda to prevent it from sinking. Archaeological investigation has discovered that the ship was wedged in between the coral reefs. The account described in the letter was not published until later. It is unknown who would have had access to the 1610 letter. The account includes the type of information that might be found in any description of a storm at sea. Available at the time were tales of Sir Walter Raleigh's expeditions, Hakliot's voyages, and an account of the storm that hit the Edward Bonaventure in 1594, off the coast of Bermuda. Edward de Vere had financed an expedition to find the Northwest Passage. The Edward Bonaventure was thought to be his ship. It is accepted that there is a link to Bermuda with the line still vexed Bermudas. But what does this phrase really mean? More about this later. There are many similarities between Virgil, Aeneid, and the Tempest. Aeneas' ship was wrecked at Carthage. He was reunited with his friends, thought to have been lost at sea. Help was supplied by the goddess Venus, Juno, and Ceres, and received a warm reception from Dido, Queen of Carthage. In addition to Prospero calling for help from Juno and Ceres, the survivors of the ship discuss Aeneas and Dido, and argue about the distinction between Carthage and Tunis which in Shakespeare's time was under control of the Ottoman Empire. Jonathan Bate argues that Book 7 of both Ovid's Metamorphosis and the Golden Translation were used as source material for The Tempest. Montaigne's essay is seen as a possible influence. Colonisation is thought to be a theme running through the play. Caliban is also an anagram of cannibal. E.K. Chambers thought that there are similarities in the Commedia dell'arte play Litre Satiri, in particular Caliban taking Trinculo as God and Trinculo and Stefano plotting to steal Prospero's book. William Thomas' History of Italy, 1549, includes a story about Prospero Adorno, Duke of Genoa, who had been deposed in 1460. Sixteen years, 16 years later, Prospero Adorno returned to rule as deputy for the Duke of Milan and made an alliance with Ferdinando, King of Naples, and continued ruling for many years. For more on this subject, see On the Date, Sources and Design of Shakespeare's The Tempest by Roger Matter and Lynn Kozitsky. Erasmus, in Norfragium, describes the dangers at sea and the absurd superstition of mariners. In this passage, he describes a phenomenon named after his namesake, St. Erasmus, often shortened to St. Elmo. Mariners from Naples saw this as a sign of protection as they prayed intercessory prayers to St. Elmo. Erasmus denounces the practice of mariners who call out for the Virgin Mary, St. Christopher and other saints. He says, as saints should not be prayed to, but God alone. He provides an elegant description of a storm. The two speakers in this dialogue are thought to be Antoon van Bergen and Adolf of Burgundy, Lord of Veer. In Act 1, scene 1 of The Tempest, the mariners do not call upon the saints. They say, to praise and mercy on us. 
they told the nobles that unless they have authority over the storm, they should get below. They seemed to be saying that only through God's mercy alone can they be saved. In Act 1, Scene 2, Ariel describes how he, like St. Elmo's fire, lands like little balls of flame around the ship. The setting of the play is a remote island off the coast of Sicily. The ship is blown off course while travelling from a wedding in Tunis, home to Naples. Richard Paul Rowe in his book, Shakespeare's Guide to Italy, provides evidence that the island's setting is Volcano. And for the rest of the fleet, which I dispersed, they all met again, and are upon the Mediterranean float, bound sadly home for Naples. Methinks our garments are now as fresh as when we put them on first in Afrique, at the marriage of the king's fair daughter, Clarabelle, to the king of Tunis. Ariel tells Prospero that the ship is where he called him to fetch up the dew, from the still-vexed Bermuths, which some argue is Bermuda's. The island itself is not Bermuda. If you were on Bermuda, you wouldn't ask someone to go and fetch something from it. The question is whether Ariel was asked to fetch dew from the Bermudas, and which Bermudas it refers to. The islands of Bermuda were named after a Spanish explorer, Juan de Bermudez, who discovered the islands in 1505. The islands were uninhabited until the sea venture drove onto the reef there, saving all the crew and passengers in 1609. There was also an area of London, known as Barmudos, a safe haven for tax dodgers, first mentioned in print in Middlesex Calendar of the Sessions Records, 1616. The Brewer's Dictionary gives the area of the Bermudas in London in the streets and alleys north of the Strand, near Covent Garden. In Shakespeare's time, the area described is the site of Cecil House. In 1605, Cecil's palace had passed to his elder son, Sir Thomas Cecil, Earl of Exeter, and was in use as the Dutch embassy when it burnt down in 1627. There is a suggestion that the Bermuda's area was notorious for producing spirits and that Shakespeare penned on aqua vita with the word dew. The earliest document record of distilling in Scotland occurred in 1494 in the Exchequer Rolls. There is no record of distilleries for producing alcoholic drinks in London until later. They were possibly introduced by the influx of Scots when they began migrating to London after King James of Scotland became King James of England. I can find no evidence that a seedy place described as Bermudas in London, where alcoholic spirits were produced and sold, existed prior to the first folio publication. Distillation was used for medical remedies, as described in great detail in Dr George Baker's New and Old Physique. If Shakespeare is referring to a medical distillation, what does he mean by Bermudas? If the dew from the still vexed vermouth refers to an alcoholic drink, vermouth sounds like vermouth, a wine mixed with herbs and fortified with alcohol. The first known vermouth was made in Turin by Antonio and Benedito Carpano in the 18th century. Although a form of the drink existed long before, its origins date back to ancient Greece, invented by Hippocrates around 400 BC. He macerated wine with wormwood and other spices and used it as, as a medicine, known then as Hippocratical, thought to be good for stomach complaints and parasites. Fortified wines containing wormwood as a principal ingredient existed in Germany around the 16th century. At around the same time, an Italian merchant started making a fortified wine with wormwood in Italy. 
The Spanish B and V are interchangeable. The German Vermut became Vermut in the Spanish-speaking areas of Italy, such as Milan and Naples. The plural of Vermut is Vermut. Hot ale and wormwood was called Pearl of Tudor England. Shakespeare uses the homophone pearl to describe drops of dew in a Midsummer Night's Dream. Listen to the pronunciation of Bermudas and Vermouth in Spanish and see what you think. Bermudas. Bermudas. Bermuds. Bermuds. Bermudas. Bermudas. Bermuds, Bermuds. We met Wormwood last video as Diane's bed. It is used by Oberon. Diane's bed or Cupid's flower has such force and blessed power. It is a native plant of North Africa and grows in abundance on the islands off the coast of Sicily. I'll put a link to the video by Teach Ethnobotany below, discussing some of the customs described within living memory about the use of wormwood. If I asked you where would you go to collect dew, you would naturally collect it off vegetation. Why would Prospero call Ariel at midnight? If Prospero, magician, scholar, alchemist, physician, was making a herbal medicine or a magic potion, it was enough just to bring the ingredients together. But the time of collection and the way the ingredients were collected were thought to add to the potency of the medicine. The position of the stars might also be important. Dew, in effect, is distilled water that condenses from the air on calm, clear nights when the air is still. When collected, it is not pure distilled water because it absorbs a chemical signature from the plants that it rests on. It wouldn't be possible to collect dew from a plant that was continuing to be tossed violently by the wind. Dew condenses on the still leaves, tormenting the leaf to give up some of its healing properties. So I think what Ariel is saying is, you know that cove where you asked me to go at midnight to collect dew from the wormwood plants? That's where the ship's hidden. One of the most popular books at the time was Remba de Doen's Herbal Creeder Book, influenced by earlier German botanists and borrowing woodcuts from Fuchs. It was translated into French, English and Latin. It was more a pharmacopoeia than a simple herbal. He had previously published books on cosmography and physiology. This is certainly the type of book that would have been in Prospero's collection of books that he prized above his dukedom. Prospero is put on an island with Caliban. Caliban is not a spirit like Ariel. He is a deformed creature. What Shakespeare describes is a human with a very congenital condition. Prospero recognised Caliban's humanity and tried to ease his distress with herbal remedies. Prospero treated Caliban kindly at first, and Miranda taught him how to speak. When thou camest first, thou strokest me and made much of me, wouldst give me water with berries in it. The Reformation brought a shift in thinking about how, how people with deformities or rare congenital conditions were treated. They were no longer treated as bad omens or evil spirits. Open minded learning, and a re-emergence of Galenic and Hippocratic principles led to a rise in non-conformist ideas among the physicians. As they were generally well-read men who circulated books among themselves, physicians most commonly faced the Inquisition for the possession of heretical literature. In 1566, Pope Pius issued a papal bull, Super Gregum Dominicum, 
all physicians were required to urge their patients to make confessions in order to be healed. Any physician breaking this rule was to be expelled from the College of Physicians, fined and have his name added to the list of suspected heretics. The College of Physicians in Venice refused to apply this rule and in 1571 a parish priest, Antonio Rocca, denounced all physicians in the city to the Inquisition. Following this, any physician failing to comply was to be banned from practising medicine and banished from the city of Venice. In 1572, physician Prospero de Foligno did not conform to the rules and one of his patients died without confession. Prospero was denounced, and when asked why he had failed to follow the rules, he said, I have no answer for this. He was summoned to appear again the following week. The outcome was not recorded, but he was still attending college meetings until 1575. It seems as though Caliban's mother, Sycorax, may have suffered the same fate. She was described as a witch, Women who practised herbal medicine became a target for the Inquisition. Many wise women who practised folk medicine were burned at the stake. One escape from execution was pregnancy. So Sycorax, who was pregnant with Caliban, was exiled to the island. We only have Prospero's word that Sycorax was evil, and she had died before Prospero came to the island. Caliban in the Catalan language of Sicily, means outcast. Let's take a doctor's approach to diagnosing Caliban's condition, with signs, symptoms and treatment. Harlequin ichthyosis is a rare congenital condition. Few children survive the neonatal period. Patients who do survive suffer from temperature dysregulation and may have a heat and cold intolerance. Patients can also have generalised poor hair growth, scarring, alopecia and contractured of digits. Children show a failure to thrive. They may have stunted growth and hypothyroidism. Some patients develop a rheumatoid factor positive polyarthritis. Survivors can also develop fish-like scales and ears can become crusted over or adhered to the scalp. A strange fish, legged like a man, and his fins like arms. Caliban talks of being frightened with urchin shows, and it feels like stepping on hedgehogs, describing the intense, itchy, stinging pain he suffers from his skin cracking. Nor lead me like a firebrand in the dark. Here he is perhaps talking about his body overheating and his inability to see. Adder's cloven tongues hiss him into madness, suggesting impaired hearing. If every step to him is painful, it's not surprising that he curses. He is cursing Prospero, not so much for causing the ailment as for failing to treat it. These ailments will not move out of Caliban's way unless Prospero bids them. Caliban says, I will fall flat. Perchance he will not mind me. Perhaps he will not see me, or perhaps he will take pity on my pain and not mind that I have fallen here. There's no cure for ichthyosis, but moisturising daily to prevent dryness and exfoliating the skin daily can help prevent scaling and the build-up of skin cells. The wet skin should be gently rubbed with a pumice stone. The island of Volcano off the coast of Sicily is famous for its mud baths and thermal springs. The benefits of thermal springs have been used as a treatment since ancient times, first mentioned by Hippocrates. Keeping Caliban's skin well hydrated might ease some of the pain. The minerals found in the springs may also contain antibacterial and anti-inflammatory properties. Sycorax, being a healer, might have given Caliban an increased chance of survival by bathing him in the healing waters. 
whereas Caliban accuses Prospero of throwing him in the mire. At first Prospero tried to help Caliban. Thou strokest me, suggests that Prospero was either applying a moisturiser or exfoliating the skin. Using a pumice stone abundant on Volcano can help remove the hard, thickened skin. Wouldst give me water with berries in it? Many berries have antimicrobial and antibiotic properties. He may also have been giving him wine with wormwood. Caliban has been prevented from roaming around the island. So not only has Prospero withdrawn the treatment, but he has also prevented Caliban from seeking his own natural remedies. At the point he meets Trinkolo and Stefano, he is probably in terrible pain. Stefano, a drunk, gives Caliban wine to drink. Caliban is not fooled into worshipping Stefano as a god just because he has been plied with alcohol. Stefano has given him pain relief. It is a natural reaction for anyone to worship someone who has the ability to take away intense chronic pain. Stefano says, How now, moon calf? How does thine egg? Caliban replies, Hast thou not dropped from heaven? In return for pain relief, Caliban offers to show him all the island has to offer, as he did for Prospero. Following the Reformation, attitudes towards people with deformities were changing, but so was the social care structure. Previously, a person might have sought help from the church and may have been taken care of by monks or nuns in an abbey hospital, financed by pilgrims giving alms to the poor as an atonement for sin. In Elizabethan England, someone like Caliban might have been forced to seek an income. It was during this time that freak shows began in England. Caliban could have earned a lot of money in side shows on the South Bank in London. Judging by the description given, it is likely that Shakespeare was familiar with someone from one of these sideshows. One of the main arguments that Will of Stratford wrote The Tempest is the date written given as 1610. As I have stressed in previous videos, no one knows when any of the plays were written. The similarities to the letters about the sea venture to lines in the Tempest, have led people to think that the play could not have been written before 1610. There is evidence that Will of Stratford was acquainted with the members of the Virginia Company, amongst whom letters could have been circulated. But the main letter in question was written in June 1610 to an unknown noble lady, and Will, who was recorded as being in Stratford, in 1610 and 1611, would have been unlikely to see this letter in time to write a play for a performance in 1611. The descriptions of the storm were fairly generic. There is an argument that The Tempest is an early play and that Shakespeare's comedies were placed in chronological order in the first folio. Alternatively, the symbolism of Prospero drowning his book leads people to think it was Shakespeare's final nod before retirement. The familiarity with Italy suggests that Shakespeare had been there. We don't know which books Will of Stratford had access to. There is no evidence that he read any books. It is well documented that Edward de Vere had access to thousands of books through his tutors and his guardians, William and Mildred Cecil. We also have documentary evidence of the books that de Vere bought for himself and others that were dedicated to him. He was possibly treated by Prospero Foligno while he was in Venice. His mother-in-law and his wife had knowledge of medicine. His personal physician even dedicated a book to his wife Anne and to de Vere himself. We don't know much about his relationship with John Dee but they both invested in overseas expeditions. Edward de Vere's personal physician, Dr George Baker, 
wrote in great detail about the process of distillation and infusion in his book Practice of the New and Old Physique, which he dedicated to him. Here he distilled water, the water of life, aquavita, wine, herbs and aromatic spices. Later in the book, he describes recipes, their uses and effects. This recipe, made with wine and hemp seeds, makes a person merry. It has long been thought that Prospero was based on alchemist and conjurer John Dee and the author himself. In 1577, De Vere and Dr Dee both became financiers of Frobisher's third expedition to find a sea route along the northern coast of America. John Dee had an interest in navigation and the discovery of new lands. He was thought to be the first person to use the term Commonwealth. John Dee dreaded the loss of his library decades before he died. In a diary entry from 24th of November 1582, he recorded a nightmare in which his books were burned by a jealous rival. In 1589, he had a similar dream. This time, it was Edward Kelly, who would by force bereave me of my books. The dream was prophetic. A month later, Dee returned to England to find that his library had been looted. John Dee was influenced by Christian Kabbalists, such as Albrecht Dürer. Dee thought he could summon angels. The most noted of these was Uriel, thought to have been the influence for the character Ariel. When de Vere became a ward of William Cecil, he read extensively. He had interests in astronomy, alchemy, medicine, law and history. In 1584, a member of Oxford's household, John Southern, dedicated a pamphlet of poems entitled Pandora to the Earl. While the young Oxford was engrossed in his study and concentrating on his writing, his lands were usurped, much like Prospero. I have been struggling to put the whole play in context. Stephen Greenblatt, in conversation at the Stratford Festival, talks about colonialism and slavery. But slaves being taken from Africa to work in the colonies didn't begin until 1619. You could just as easily watch an episode of Bear Grylls, The Island, to pick up themes from The Tempest. The need for fresh water, the need to fetch wood, power struggles. Even though Caliban the slave, in inverted commas, is told to fetch the wood, it is not beneath Miranda and Ferdinand to fetch wood. Keeping a fire going is of the utmost importance. In Shakespeare's time, there was excitement about exploration to the new world. But colonialism and the slave trade came later. I agree with Greenblatt that a theme of the play is isolation and forgiveness. Prospero has been angry about his exile, but in the end he forgives those who exiled him and asks for forgiveness and mercy. In the epilogue he addresses the audience. But who is the audience? This is where I agree with another Stephen. Stephen Sabel. Time and time again, Shakespeare is addressing his most important audience member, Queen Elizabeth. There is a clue in Act 3, Scene 3, that this play was written during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. She was often referred to as the Phoenix. There is one tree, the Phoenix throne, one phoenix, at this hour reigning there. The epilogue, spoken by Prospero, as Edward de Vere, might suggest that the play was written around 1583. During the 1570s, he had charmed the Queen and was a favourite at court. There is evidence that he provided the Queen with lavish entertainments. In 1581, 
he was imprisoned in the Tower of London with his mistress Anne Vavasor and their newborn child. He only spent a few weeks in the Tower, but on his release from the Tower he was kept in relative isolation under house arrest. He was reconciled with the Queen in 1583 and was allowed to return to court and continue with his office of Lord Great Chamberlain of England. He would not be able to charm her as he had done previously, but only rely on her mercy to forgive him. In the 1580s, he gathered together some of the best writers in the country at his newly acquired property, Fisher's Folly. He is requesting Elizabeth's help and blessing in this new project to create a college of writers. In 1586, she grants him an annuity of a £1,000 a year. When Miranda innocently asks, Are you not my father? Prospero answers, Thy mother was a piece of virtue, and she said thou wast my daughter. It was common knowledge in court that Edward de Vere denied that his firstborn, Elizabeth, was his. After his reconciliation with his wife Anne at Christmas time, 1581, he accepted Elizabeth as his daughter. Still exiled from court, perhaps de Vere spent time teaching his daughter, his only heir at the time. In Act 3, Ariel appears as a harpy to chide Alonso, Sebastian and Antonio. A harpy is a supporter on the arms of Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford. His colours are black and tawny. Green, in French, is vert. Green, or vert, is sometimes used as a pun on de Vere. Other evidence linking de Vere with a tempest is the woodcut in the first folio. The woodcut, in part, first appears on Thomas Watkins' Hecatompathia, which was dedicated to Edward de Vere. In the first folio, it appears in full, with the completed Cayley Greyhound. The Cayley Greyhound is a mythical animal that is found in British heraldry, in one place only. The Cayley Greyhound was used in the arms of the 13th to the 16th Earls of Oxford. The debate over whether the Tempest was written after de Vere died still rages, more due to the similarities between the events in the play and the reports of the sea venture, rather than any reliance on the line still vexed by moths. But I think that in the search for a hidden meaning, or pun, to Bermudas, the most obvious surface meaning has been overlooked. Collecting dew from wormwood plants is the literal meaning. The pen is fetching an alcoholic drink with wormwood, either vermouth, which was becoming a popular drink on the continent, or maybe even a form of absinthe, which would have been available at the time, although didn't reach popularity or notoriety until a few centuries later. Perhaps you could let me know in the comments below whether you agree with my interpretation of the word vermouths and Caliban's disease. Yes. After recording this presentation, I found it difficult to believe that no one had made the obvious link between Wormwood and Bermuths. So I searched again to see if I could find any other references. I found one, in an essay by Charles Graves, dated 2015. Independently, I have reached a very similar conclusion to him, about the meaning of the term Bermuths and the inspiration for the play being Edward de Vere's time under arrest. I will leave a link to this and my other sources in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching Shakespeare in Context with Claire. Please like and press the bell icon to receive notification of the next video. The Comedy of Errors